But without further ado, I'm going to bring out the man that y'all came here to see. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for the very funny Shane Todd. Come on! <laughs> York, we're not here to take part, we're here to take poppers. It was poppers, guys. Um, you guys, I've done poppers once in my life. Probably like a lot of people, similar story. First time doing drugs, I was at a house party, someone's uncle put poppers under a radiator, didn't tell anybody, and just I, I say house party, it was just me and him at it, but and I say someone's uncle, mine, but this is my first US tour, unbelievable, hard place to get into America, fair play. Respect. <laughs> you guys do not make it easy. I don't know if you've been in Dublin airport and just seen a line of 50 people getting ready to lie. Just, <laughs> and, and, and then I gotta say that, and then sweet. What's the purpose of your visit? Um, whatever you need it to be. Like, I don't know if you try to get into Ireland, piece of piss. It is, in the American airports, you guys have like the x-ray machines. You have the TSA guys, you have these just, angry, young, intense jack guys that just fucking... <laughs> Who the fuck are you? <laughs> Nobody! And... <laughs> You're a piece of shit. Oh, yes, I'm a piece of shit. <laughs> you fucking hate yourself? Yes, yes. Uh, the American border guards, these guys, I don't know if they get paid. <laughs> Irish airport's a little bit of fun, you know? Trying to get into America, not a banter heavy zone at all. Obviously trying to get into Ireland, a lot easier. If you're not from home, but you're trying to get over to Ireland, not as tough. In our airports, we don't have like the, the x-ray machines or the sniffer dogs or the, the guys with the rifles. We just have an elderly man. <laughs> Weird thing is he works both airports, just kind of. He comes and goes, some days he's there, some days he's not, and, and he's blind. You'll know, um, I'm sure you met Brendan, but that is our, that's our war on drugs. Even if you have drugs, he's like, come on, go on, have a good time. Enjoy yourself. Are you from home, sir? England? You've been dragged here, I could have lied about it, you know, for sure. Um, yeah, and where about you from? Texas? How have you come here? You just thought, he would like an Irish comedian. Like, I have to perform for the Englishman, you think? You thought, you thought Ewan would appreciate a court jester to come and remind him of the centuries where our people, just for his enjoyment, had to get up and... This guy's sitting here like a medieval English king. I wish American people would stop asking me to explain Brexit when I get into an Uber. I don't know what it is. Um, I don't know what it is, and here's the thing. I don't, this guy doesn't, nobody from Ireland knows what a Brexit is. But we will definitely act like we do know what it is. Cause you have to pretend like you're on top of your local politics. As Soon as I get into an Uber, guy's like, what's the deal with this Brexit? I do the thing we all do when we want to seem like we know what we're talking about. It's the same with any politics. All you do is exhale, shake your head and say, it's fucked. <laughs> The guy's like, that's so interesting. I was like, I know, I know. <laughs> we're like, cause, cause I'm from the north, the north of Ireland, I'm from Northern Ireland. We're, we're kind of, you know, with, with Brexit, we're caught in between like the EU, the UK, Ireland. We're like the kids in a divorce and we're just waiting to see who's offering the coolest shit. Like we, <laughs> we're sort of working all angles at the minute. But you guys do it too. Cause I turned around to my Uber driver, who was a local guy. And I was like, what about your politics, man? I was like, what about this Roe v. Wade? What about gun control? The guy's like, it's fucked. <laughs> I was supposed to come here uh, about a year and a half ago. Couldn't, I'm not gonna spend too much of the show talking about, you know, before times. What a lot of people actually back home pronounced as COVID. <laughs> Which just to let you know, that is not how you say it. I genuinely thought we had a different pandemic. I was like, <laughs> Everyone else in the world is fighting COVID, but we are going fully against COVID, which seem to be spelled C-O-F-I-T-T, -T -T, like COVID. People in Ireland had a very lesbian attitude towards COVID. No respect for the D. These people... <laughs> 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 
COVID. When America opened, it opened. We did it in stages, which is weird. I don't know if any state had it here, but we did this thing, and I still don't know whether this actually happened or not, or I, I just made this up, but there was definitely a moment back home where the government went, listen, when we've had a hard time with COVID, we're opening up the bars again. Get back out there, go and enjoy yourselves, have a pint with friends, have a great time, reconnect with family. But if you dance, you're going to jail, that's illegal. Just to, just to throw that in, it's illegal to dance. It was illegal to dance back home. The nightclubs were open, but you had to just stand there like, oh fuck. Can we sweat? Is a sweat? The police were like, you cannot sweat. Do you know how difficult that is when you haven't been out of the house in a year and a half? You're in a nightclub and everyone's just, oh Jesus Christ, this is nice. They literally blamed it on the boogie. I don't know what the science behind it was. I don't think the dancing was causing any death, you know? I don't think anyone's official cause of death was Gangnam Style. I don't think there was ever a more guy filling out a form like, that sounds stupid saying that. More, what we call more guy? Like, Mortician? No, that, no, that's so. That's a mother in the Adams family. I mean, I know. No, I mean a. Okay. No, that's well, that's when two lines meet. I mean, <laughs> they're like Americans are stupid. I'm like, shut up, they're not. Um, somebody said necrophilia. Not what I'm talking about at all. I love it. Where are you from, it? So specific. Just a specific village back home, love that. You give me your postcode. For some reason, BT26, that's a tease, because you give me the first half of it, and you're like, come on, chase me through San Francisco, I'll give you the rest. <laughs> I said to my dad when the pub's re my dad's 72, are you looking forward to getting back out? Because he would've went to the pub every Friday night, and Saturday night, and Sunday night, and Monday night, and Tuesday night. <laughs> And my dad says, no, I can't, 72. I said, are you worried about social distance? Are you worried about getting COVID? And my dad's like, it's not that. What if they're doing a sting operation? He says, please tell me more about what you mean right now. My dad goes, what if the police try and get me? What if me and the boys go to the bar, standing there with a pint in my hand? What if they stick on the YMCA? What if the policeman is a DJ? I don't know if anybody went to jail for it. Like, I don't know if anyone's dad did just like one night in prison back home because they danced on the night out. But I, I like the idea of that. Your dad on the bottom bunk of a jail cell one night all scared. Not, you know your dad, your dad would be so scared. You know your dad just in his pajamas all, all, all frail and all scared. As soon as lights go out his first night in there, the guy in the top bunk, I've killed five people, mate, that's why I'm here. What about you? Why are you in here? Your dad. The Macarena, the government. Sting operation. And now that we're out, I have questions I've been sitting on for a long time. But I wanted to ask people in America this for a while. Why is it that when men get older um, and they're talking about women, why do their mouths get smaller? Here's what I mean. You're in primary school, you see a girl you like, you say, oh, I really fancy her. She's gorgeous. Big open mouth. You're in secondary school, you know, you're 12, 13, you see a girl you like? Oh, I really like her. She's beautiful. Mouth a bit smaller. Guys in their 30s, on Tinder, their mate's like, oh, do you like her? Oh, why? Oh, why? <laughs> why then, when you get to my dad's age of 72, why when a female jogger of questionable age goes past, why can my dad not open his mouth at all? Like, why does my dad just nudge me and go, do you see it, do you see it, dude? Oh my God, do you see it? Oh, Jesus Christ. Jesus. I can't tell what he's saying, but I know what's not good. Science? Yeah, I love doing stand-up. Like, this is my favorite job in the world. You know, I, I love it so much. But you gotta be careful what you say. I said something recently to a friend, not in stand-up, just in everyday life. She said, that's homophobic. I was so embarrassed. She was telling me about her cousin. All I know about him is he's a gay guy that lives in Belfast. I've never met him. She told me he was opening up a gym in the gay quarter of Belfast. And without thinking, I said, oh, that's great, congratulations. I hope he does really well. It's like a, is it like a, like a, like a gay gym? I don't know if you've seen anybody nowadays get so offended that their spine physically curves, but she said, is it a, hmm. Now, why would you use the term 
gay gym. Why? Why would it not just be a gym? Why? I helped her back up and I said, I don't know why I said that, I'm so sorry. I know it's just like a gym. He happens to be gay. It happens to be in the gay corner. I'm so sorry. And she then patronized me, which I thought was a, a bit unfair. She said, if I told you he was opening up a butcher's, would you have thought it was a gay butcher's? I was like, can I be honest? <laughs> Yes. Up until 35 seconds ago, I assumed it was Northern Ireland's first ever gay butchers. <laughs> and let's not kid ourselves. Sounds kind of delicious, right? <laughs> Said to my wife here, what are we having for dinner tonight? She's like, oh, I stopped by the gay butchers and picked something up. Oh. Flamingo Phil. San Francisco, I don't want to offend anybody. I know San Francisco, maybe the gay capital of the world. I don't want to offend anybody here. And I couldn't, I could never be considered homophobic because I was actually given a title or an honor uh, by the gay community back home whenever I was a, a kid. When I was in school, I was genuinely crowned, I know you won't believe this, but the gay lord. <laughs> you guys didn't know you were in the presence of royalty, but I hadn't applied for it. I didn't know I was being considered. I hadn't heard of it up until then, but then these older boys were like, hey, you're a fucking gay lord. I said, gentlemen, it would be an honor. It would be an honor to serve. I felt great. I was chuffed. I was like, I, I will, I'll be out here protecting these guys. That's why I'm here. I'm doing stand up and I'm protecting the gay community of America. I'm doing whatever I need to do because I am the gay lord. <laughs> a lot of pressure for a nine year old when, um, you know, when a couple of teachers give you that accolade. It's, um... <laughs> And I got carried away. I called a load of guys in my class round. Gay lords, like medieval, like Braveheart. I need to give them like a rousing speech. Called a few boys round. I was like, gentlemen, I am the gay lord. <laughs> Kneel before me. That's silly. That's silly. That's silly. Prepare to kiss the ring. That's, that's the silliest bit of the show. Um, I'm sorry. During COVID, I had a, had a baby. I'm a, I'm a first baby. Yeah, cheers. We had a water birth, me and my wife, we had a water birth. I was doing a gig in Glasgow, Scotland, and said, oh, I had a water birth. And some guy in the darkness, in the audience went, I hate wet babies. I was like, that's a mental, <laughs> that's a mental thing to say. <laughs> On stage or off. <laughs> Bizarre policy, like. <laughs> we had a water birth, don't know if anyone's had kids in, maybe you had a, 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 a dry birth, like a, like a lamb birth or whatever. <laughs> it's all about mum, like she has the biggest role to play. I had to do little jobs, like um, I had to bring candles, uh, dim lighting, she told me to bring music, so I brought Van Morrison uh, with me. And, which she said was uncomfortable, but I was like, you did say something like Van Morrison, I've got him. Um, if you have a water birth, you get, to, you get to have a suite. You get to make it your own. You're not just on the ward. You've got your own little suite, and ours was amazing. Real calm, tranquil environment. Now, I wanted to support my wife. She was in the birthing pool. I said to the midwives, I was like, guys, I don't want to seem stupid here. I don't know if you've thought about this. I'm sure you have, but what are you actually going to do at the moment when the child comes out? Because I don't know if you guys know this, but um, just between us, this guy does not know how to swim. <laughs> so what can we do about that? Like. He's not gonna make it up to the surface. And the midwife's like, uh, the umbilical cord? I was like, uh, that's not in his mouth. That's not, I was like, I don't think he's gonna know to use that as a, as a snorkel. Like it's not. And they're giving me, looks like I'm weird. And I was like, the midwife said to me, dad, if there's a medical emergency, that's when, that's when you need to speak. I said, no worries. And, Balancing a brown eyed girl, it was beautiful. And, uh, <laughs> distracting, but beautiful. Uh, and he brought a saxophone, which uh, was too loud. I was like, we don't need that. And the midwives told me, they said, listen, we check if your baby's coming out. It's like, do you put on a wee snorkel? Like, how do you... I'm stupid, right? I was like, how do you do it? And they said, no, no, we've got a mirror. I learned two things that day. To check if a baby's coming out in the water, they use, you know the wee mirrors the bomb disposal people use? 
I learned that they use that, and also I learned that it's impossible, no matter how medically qualified you are, to look into one of those and not make this face. <laughs> I said to my wife, I'm gonna support you emotionally and physically. I put my arms under my wife. I said, lean on me, you lean on me. And she was like, I think the baby's coming. And uh, she was leaning down on me, pressing her weight down. And, yeah, we can see ahead, the baby's coming. It is all about mum, um, but my arm actually got stuck in between, at a really weird angle, in between the bath and my wife's pressure. And I, as I, they did say, if there's a medical emergency, and I, My arm was very sore. Like, I, cause then I needed to stand up, but I couldn't cause apparently my wife does MMA. I was like, why? <laughs> and I, cause I got one arm out and then I said, I was just, I said, medical emergency. <laughs> and the middle I said, what is it? And I said, my arm's very sore. <laughs> Would we be able to get my arm out? Can we take five here? And then um, it's mental that my arm is still in this scenario. And eventually I managed to sort of slip it out. After that, I just sort of zoned out and like got on with the rest of the pregnancy. Um, without complaining, you know? Unlike some, but no, no names, but um, <laughs> Our son came out and it was, it was an amazing moment. But here's the thing, we, we were expecting um, just like a normal sized baby. We were told everything was normal about the pregnancy. Midwives kept telling us that everything's good, everything's normal. Here's the thing about a water birth, you don't know what your baby looks like. You don't know what kind of baby you're having until your baby is brought out of the water and presented to you like a prize at a village raffle. Like by the midwives. Like, Oh. Genuinely, I thought that was a drive-by. I'm already, I'm already on edge here. That would be so terrible if I got shot dead in Chicago. But, but that'd be such a cool story to tell back home. Oh my God. He got capped in Chi-Town. Whoa, sorry guys. Uh, second chance at life here, wow. Ooh. I just put a lot of things into perspective. <laughs> oh, wow. Here's the thing about a water birth. You don't know what you're getting until your baby is presented to you like a prize at a village raffle, like a mystery. <laughs> just scooped out and it's like, well done. Because if you have like a normal, like dry birth, I don't know, for some reason I feel disrespectful, but. <laughs> I mean, it's like not the right term, but it, like if you have a traditional birth, you'll see like a head, you'll see an arm or whatever. With a water birth, you don't see anything till the baby's out. Now we had been expecting a baby. Our baby weighed in at 11.2 ounces, which is rude. I also heard an actual, I think, American guy go, damn, which I've always wanted to hear. And I love that, whoever did that, I appreciate it. Let's play some b-ball after this. I don't know what that is. I don't know what that is. I had so many questions for the guy. Why were you balking for nine months inside my wife? Like, why was this guy on a creatine heavy diet? When my son came out of the water, I genuinely thought a male nurse had slipped and fallen into the birth pool. And in some hilarious mix up, they were gonna get him out first. Cause even I was joking with the guy. I was like, get out of here, come on. This joker, this joker right here, come on. And the guy looked at me and he said, no daddy. I kind of get a little bit emotional sometimes talking about this, but whenever, so does this guy, whenever, um, and, and oddly, same size as my son. I actually thought that was him for a sec. My instinct kicked in, I nearly, I, I haven't seen him in two weeks, so I was like, so. Oh. I'm gonna see if that guy will let me give him a hug outside after the show, just to. Boy, he's gonna feel awkward for the rest of the show. That's a shame. <laughs> Eleven point two ounces. My wife was out of it with a gas and air. She said, "What does he look like? Is he beautiful?" I said, "He looks like a taxi dispatcher." I was like, "If I'm, if I'm honest, if I'm honest, he looks like in a rough part of town." Like he the midwife said, "You've got a beautiful baby boy." I said, "Who the fuck is this medium-sized man?" 
Shit, do you want to hold him? We looked like two soldiers, two wounded soldiers escorting each other off a battlefield. We were like... <laughs> the midwife was, she was pretty young and she came up to me and said, would dad like to do skin on skin? I said, I'm married, you cheeky bitch. <laughs> My son winked at me, he said, go for it, mate, go for it. I, I, don't be disrespectful to your mother. What? <laughs> 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 no. And she said, it's not that. What happens is we take you into a side room, you take your shirt off, you hold your son against you, you hold him on your knee, your heartbeat feels his heartbeat, you'll be bonded for life. I said, oh my God, that sounds amazing. And it, it is all about mum, but this is, my, this is my little moment. And I went into a side room, took my shirt off and got ready for him. But one minute later, a couple of midwives came in. I'll never forget it. They scooped me up and put me in his knee. And I said, <laughs> I said, this is the wrong way around. Um, and then I tried to explain, but he'd already put like a wee knitted hat and mittens on me. And I was like, and then I was actually quite comfy after a while and my arm was still pretty sore, so I was happy enough just to, just to chill on his knee. I'm not saying this is the reason, as a guy, you should have a kid, but what about the moment whenever you're leaving hospital and you get to put up one of these photos on social media? Car seat? I got so, like, sassy with mine, just so... My wife said, why are you biting your lip? I was like, no, just keep, just keep getting... You're putting a lot of arse into this. I'm like, I know, just <laughs> expecting mothers and contractions trying to get past me in the automatic doors. I was like, you will wait, you will wait, you will wait. We're getting angles here. Caption, the wee man. <laughs> and his son. <laughs> He's advanced in a lot of ways. Even when we're leaving the hospital one day after he was born, I was so nervous about the car seat. Cause that's kind of like the dad's like main job is getting the car seat in. I'd never done that before. There's all these clips and straps and I was so nervous about it. My hands were shaking and I was a little bit faint from the birth. So luckily for us, our son drove. So. <laughs> I was in hospital twice over COVID. The other time I got circumcised. Um... Shalom. I am. Um... When I told people I was getting circumcised, this is 100% true, the main question people asked me was, is that for medical reasons? <laughs> My mom rang me and said, is that for medical reasons? Susan, it certainly isn't for banter. <laughs> How bored do you think I am in lockdown? I'm looking for a group on, like, no, I've done that, done that. Oh! Now there's a day out of the house. <laughs> of course it was for medical reasons, Jesus Christ. People were like, oh, you'll get loads of jokes out of that as a comedian. I was even joking with a doctor. Oh, is there any chance, like, could you do me a bit of a deal, do me a bit of a discount? But he pointed out um, he already was going to take 10% off, so. <laughs> you guys like jokes and all that? That's all the jokes when my circumcision done. I actually thought the surgeon was that good that I, um, I left a tip. <laughs> One day after I got it done, my mum said, let me ask you a question, maybe stupid. She said, are you Jewish now? <laughs> are you Jewish now, question mark? I was like, mum, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I didn't read the pamphlet well enough. I mean, now that I think about it, I think, yes, I think I, think I am. Women have more questions than guys. Like guys just wince, but women are like, they want to know loads about it. Is it really sore? It sort of feels like I've had part of my dick cut off. Like, <laughs> it is a wee bit sore. And my wife was like, is it really bad? And, and then she said, I don't know why I'm asking. I'd have no way of knowing what that pain's like. And I said, actually you would. And I'll tell any women here who are curious about what the pain of a circumcision's like. You know your eyelids? Imagine having them cut off and then just going to the top of a mountain and staring at the wind. <laughs> I love doing stand-up. I used to work in a call centre, hated it, didn't like it, wanted to do stand-up, but told myself this is what I should do. I was aiming for 
just a life that was grand. Now in America, England, a few other places, your idea of grand's here. You guys talk about like properties as being grand. 50 bedrooms, swimming pool, it's a palace, it's grand. In Ireland, when we say something's grand, it, 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 it means it, it's not shit. <laughs> But it's not good. <laughs> you still don't know what our grand is. If I'm in a, a restaurant in America and I ask for Coke and the waitress says she only has Pepsi, that's grand. <laughs> grand is what Irish people are searching for in life. Just feeling grand. Not your best self. See people run about America. Come on, buddy, you can do this. You can be your best self. All we would like to do before we die is at one point go, this is grand. Grand used to be the best. Grand used to be where it was at. It used to be a golden age where, where just grand was enough. And you would tell people you were grand and that shut down conversations. For example, if you saw someone you vaguely knew in a supermarket, you're just pushing your wee trolley along, you'd see a guy you vaguely knew, you'd say, all right, mate, how are you? And the guy would say, yes, mate, grand. What about you? You'd say, yes, mate, grand. Both lying, like both really gone in the head, like both. <laughs> gone, barely holding it down. Like I'm on the, a person, I'm on the, I can't speak for that guy. I'm on the verge of something massive, but um, <laughs> potentially in Chicago. And I, uh, just me in a suit of ferrets doing laps of the bean. You know what I mean? Like I, I, I don't know what it is, but it's gonna be wild. By the way, it's uh, just like any locals know, uh, it's embarrassing, but, but it, it, it's actually Chicago. Uh, just let's move on. Um, I, I, I know you don't know that, but there's an R that no one, Seems to be willing to acknowledge. It's Chicago. Don't you mean Chicago? No. I mean Chicago, what it's called. Anyway, it's not like that nowadays. Because of things like life coaches, we're pursuing this idea of being our best self. People telling you things like, you need the thought journal. Why are you not thought journaling? Here's why I'm not thought journaling. The last thing I want to do is write down what's in here. I don't want a printed record of my head. Because even that would tear, I'd be like, Jesus, what the fuck? <laughs> That's evidence, you know what I mean? <laughs> and I was always happy with Grand, but be, you need to be your best self. And that means interactions like that are different. See someone you vaguely know in the supermarket in 2022? Alright, mate, how are you? Guy's like, <sighs> why is he putting his basket down? He's like, mm. <laughs> Four hours later, he's got you in a headlock. There's a melted Viennetta ice cream, just fully. <laughs> I'm not dismissive of, of mental health or, or friends' emotional baggage. Although when it comes to emotional baggage, I'm a little bit like a budget airline. I can take it. I'm like, you know, right at the, right at the departure gate, right when you're just about to board the plane. I'm like that with, car with carry-on luggage. I'm like that with mental health problems. I can take your baggage. Like I can take about that much, you know, like a little, <laughs> like a little case of it. You know what I mean? Because if you're coming to me and I think you're lugging up like full blown, like a big case, in my head I have like, you know those machines the airlines have? Like the wee, the wee boxes and you need to fit your stuff in. I have one of those and if I think you have too much, I'm like, oh, that's gonna be 80 euro. You know what I mean? I'm like, how much do I look like if I didn't do stand up? I would be one of those ladies at the departure gate just like, do you wanna, oh. Oh. No, 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 yeah, it should go. Do you want to just uh, pop, pop it in, pop it in and we'll see. It, de it definitely will fit. <laughs> that's it, kick it. Yes, that's it, that's it. Aww. <laughs> $60, you know what I mean? Like that's... <laughs> They're real bricks. I, um... <laughs> Are you from home, but you work in tech out here? You fucking made it, man. <laughs> he works in the canteen of Microsoft, but he's the richest man in Northern Ireland. You wash the dishes? Fucking right. But here's the thing, you're that high up in tech, you don't even touch them. You just, bloop. Done. Handless dishwashing. What's your name? James, you're living the dream, man. You, what, what company do you work for? Is it one of the big ones? It's a startup? Not interested. Um, <laughs> Not interested. Marketing software? But what's different about it? Like, why should I be investing? I don't have any money to invest. <laughs> Highly targeted? 
you don't know what that means either. <laughs> Why should I invest? This and that. How high, James? As high as it can go? Fuck me, take my pin code. I'm giving it. Guys, everyone's gonna give James $500 on the way out of this show. We're taking this company to the top. I used to work in a call center and I hated it. But one day when I was there in the pursuit of, of trying to just be like more than grand. I, I remember I had a boss who was a re real good looking guy. One day he called me into his office. He said, listen, I've got a special mission for you. I said, you want me to suck your dick? He said, <laughs> he said, not at all. It's nothing to do with that. I was like, well, offers air big shooter, you know? But he, he said, no. He said, you've got a co-worker that's taken 40 minutes a day out of a shift to go down to the men's toilets. We don't know what he's doing out of there. Go down and find out what he's doing because we can't just accuse him of anything weird. And guys, let me, let me just say, you're like, that's an invasion of welfare. This is like 2016, so this is a different time. This is, you know, you know the era I'm talking about. This is when you could do stuff like this and you could sneak up to someone in the toilets and, and, and find out what, what they were doing for 45 minutes. And I... <laughs> so I sneak into the toilets. I have my back to the wall. I have not made a noise. I'm brilliant at this. I'm like just at the back. There's a guy in there with a hand dryer, one other guy. Then he leaves and I use that sound to like pick up a position. This other guy walked out. Whoosh, get out of here, Richard. Um, no, again, it's like you could do it. You know what I mean? This is still the golden age of a wee... We man the man patting the bum. Like nowadays, obviously, I'd have to get a, to fill out a form or whatever before I did it. But it would take some fun out of it if you're one of your mates. But this was a different time, so I snuck in. I was there for 10 minutes without making a noise. I'm going to hear him watching something on his phone that's weird, or I'm going to hear him talking to somebody. This guy was making no noise in the one cubicle in the toilets. You see, when I took a knee, it got weird. It got weird because I realized if I couldn't hear him, I needed to see. There was a little gap under the toilet door where the ground met the bottom of the door. If I can just get a look in. Now, not up, it's not weird, but in. If you see people's feet, you see if they're doing something weird. And that's like an old like Aborigines thing or something. And I crossed the line. See when both of my knees hit the floor? When I was on both knees in the boys' toilets? The, the men's toilets? No, I said boys. Um, I met men's. Actually, this is a story about why I can't teach anymore. Um, <laughs> what are you boys doing in there? No, I... What happens if somebody comes in and then accuses me of something? Don't worry about it, because I can just tell them I'm practicing proposing. And I look like a wee boy who would have done that before he got married. And I did do that. Twice a night, just... We're 20 minutes in, this guy's not made a noise. In the pursuit of being more than grand, I end up in press up position. But maybe I don't want to see what he's doing. What is he doing? What if he has like, you know, socks and shoes off? That'd be weird. Why are you taking your socks and shoes off in the toilets? After like a while of what should I do, I snuck a little bit of a look in. And guys, he wasn't there. Uh, he wasn't doing anything sexual. He wasn't talking to anybody on the phone. Way weirder than that, the guy was just in exactly the same position as me. Smiling. <laughs> I had not made a noise since I'd been in there. The guy was just waiting, like this. And he looked at me very casually and said, all right, partner. <laughs> he had no questions for me as to why I was there. I said, doing grand, what, what about you? He said, yes, mate. I'm here all the time. I said, I'm, I'm gonna go back up. Um, <laughs> if that's okay, I got up. I said to my boss, what, what had happened? My boss like, was it anything weird? I was like, the three of us are going to jail tonight. <laughs> and I'm not going in a cell above him because I don't want to hear, all right, partner, at any point in my life again. <laughs> he was doing what he needed to, oh, thanks. Thanks for the most unenthusiastic, non-joined in clap with. Something could have happened there, but a few people in the middle, no, no, no. A couple of people in the middle could have really got on the back of that, but chose not to. And I see that as a slight and vaguely racist um, to me. Wow, I know. <laughs> What's your name? 
Dan, you're key to the whole operation. If a bit of a clap breaks out because you're at that side, you fucking go for it. And that's going to help it spread, Dan. So remember that. And I'll... No, 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 no. It has to be natural. I appreciate you, sir. How do you guys know each other? Kids? Kids? Sir, you're at least 40. <laughs> you're at least 40. There's no way you're telling me you guys are a couple of kids. There's no... There is no... You pass yourself off as a schoolboy? This is not work. This cover is not working. I told my wife that story. Like, what do you think of this? And my wife went, yeah, that is really weird. Been married, Grant. It is... <laughs> it's not shit. <laughs> but it's not good. <laughs> it's grand, let's be honest, it's grand. We don't really argue, but when we do, it's about things you didn't think were possible for people to argue about. We get creative with it. We live in the WhatsApp voice note generation. Back in the day, you would text somebody, still on for lunch, and that's a one word text back, yes or no. Nowadays, because of the voice note generation, 11 minutes of <laughs> chat. All right, man, just jumping in the car here, just uh, thought of jump, always oh, jumping, aren't they? Just thought of jumping in the car, thought of jump on a voice note. What a jump out of the car, speed up and jump out of the car. <laughs> My wife heard me listen to a voice note from a friend. She said, Why does he sound like that? Why is he all high pitched? I said, Oh, do you not know? I was like, I listen to my voice notes on 1.5 speed. I, I speed it up. If you know exactly what I'm talking about, Mrs. Right here. Where are you from? Te why do I have a huge Texas fan base? Like, why has this happened? How'd you find out about the show? The bartender at the pub told you he listens to my podcast. Hey, that's my marketing team. All right. <laughs> they were like, they were like, do you want to spend money on Facebook ads? We could make them highly targeted. I said, <laughs> I said, I said, no, just get a guy to go around the bar. So that's what I want. My wife said, why does he sound like that? I said, 1.5 speed. You get through it a bit quicker, but it makes people's voice a little bit high pitched. She's like, oh, I've never heard of that. That's a, that's a bit creepy. I was like, it literally isn't. I don't have time to listen to these messages. And my wife said something terrifying. She said, see when I send you a voice note? Do you, uh... <laughs> <laughs> hmm. <laughs> do you, um... Do you listen to me in this 1.5 speed, you eat creep? I said, no. I was like, let me be honest, you're my wife. I listen to you in two speed. I was like, if I'm honest, <laughs> Just uh, She cracked up. She said, what's wrong with my voice notes? I said, no, nah, nothing, nothing. Then we had a bit of an argument. I said, do you know what, see, from now on, I'm gonna listen to you in 0.5 speed. I was out for a compromise. I doubled down, I said, you send me a 10 minute voice note, it'll take me 20 minutes to get through it. And then she said, what's wrong with my voice notes anyway? I could have said nothing. <laughs> Last week on the way home from a show, you sent me a nine minute voice note telling me to get bread. And that's nine minutes of someone telling somebody else that has got bread before to get bread. I could have been a one word text that said bread. <laughs> if I'm out of the house and you send me a one word text and you're in the house and it says bread, I won't look at it like this. What the fuck? <laughs> I'm that good at getting bread that in Ireland I could get you a loaf of bread at 10 o'clock on a Sunday night. And the Americans and people in the Texas fan base are like, what's so cool about that? In Ireland, everywhere is only open on Sundays from 1 p.m. to 6 p.m. for Jesus. <laughs> because we have a little bit of respect and etiquette. <laughs> so we stop tourists getting coffees on Sunday mornings for the Lord God. You guys are open from six or whatever. When I see someone getting a coffee at 11 on a Sunday morning in America, I'm like, you fuck, that's disgrace. <laughs> he didn't die for this, like. <laughs> I think it's pretty clear in the Bible to say, <laughs> one o'clock on a Sunday is the acceptable time. It's in the Old Testament. Can you just imagine what it's going to sound like now with our new system? When I fly home in the Dublin airport, get in my car, tell my wife I'm on the way home, blip, get a voice note. So you're on your way home to me. <laughs> on your way home from America. 
Remember to stop and get bread. <laughs> and here, don't just be lifting the first loaf of bread. <laughs> on the shelf. You always do that. <laughs> Who do you think you are? <laughs> Don't I always say <laughs> to put the ones that are going out of date at the front? So dicks like you come along <laughs> and just grab the first loaf of bread you come to. If you love your family, <laughs> you'd be prepared to dig. We could get an extra two, three, four days out of a loaf of bread. Anyway, I'll not keep you. <laughs> But when you are getting the bread, <laughs> if you're in the store anyway, <laughs> get me a surprise as well. <laughs> Guys, can you just imagine what that's gonna be like whenever I start listening to it slow down? <laughs> My wife's gonna fucking kill me when she hears that joke, like, no doubt. I'm just acting a big man because I'm in Chicago, but I know for a fact, I know for a fact as soon as I get home, the next time she hears that material and I'm trying to creep up a stair so I don't wake up her in my giant song, I know for a fact, I'll just hear a voice from the shadows. We need to have a talk. <laughs> I, I don't sound like that. Here's the thing about me. I hate name dropping, right? And I was saying this recently to, um, you, you guys know Kevin Hart? <laughs> no. <laughs> what? <laughs> All right. <laughs> New York's premier medium? Why is this guy? <laughs> it doesn't work that way around. You don't say it and then go, I fucking knew you were gonna say that. <laughs> What's your name? Tommy. Tommy? Shut up. Guys, uh, <laughs> Didn't see that one coming. <laughs> Kevin Hart was in Belfast to shoot a film for Netflix. I was doing warm up for 24 shows, co headlining with. Uh, <laughs> while he was here for three months, he wanted to do a load of comedy shows, and people thought that was like the best thing ever. People who had never come to my shows before were like, oh, can you give me 12 tickets for Kev? <laughs> Dad, why not? <laughs> come see me. <laughs> And during the run of shows, people were just talking to me flat out about Kevin Hart. What's Kevin Hart like? I was like, Kev? Because I, I, I knew <laughs> Is he as funny off stage as he is off? Or does he take himself really seriously? Or does he have a big ego? What's he like? What does he smell like? Here's the thing. <laughs> I never met really Kevin Hart. <laughs> I'd go on at the start of the night, in front of about 150 people. I'd say, guys, welcome to the show. My name's Shane Todd. And then I'd do a short set. As I was on stage, Kevin Hart and his entourage would arrive in a side door to a different part of the building. So he wasn't mobbed on the way in. He's the biggest star in the world, I get it. Then, after about 15 minutes, I would get a little torch from the side of the stage that let me know from his tour manager, Kevin's ready to go on. Now normally I'd see that light and go, he can fucking wait, right? I never said that, I never said that, I never said that. I was always like, all right, and then, um, and I would get a flash and I would go, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, Kevin Hart. The only interaction I ever had with him was in the darkness, we would do like a handshake. Now, here's the thing about me, I'm from Ireland. If we've never met, we shake hands like this first. Hand pointed down at the ground, eyes at the ground, don't make eye contact, <laughs> don't look at anyone. First time we did it, he goes in like this. I don't know what to do, I've never, I've seen this in the movies. <laughs> But I've never done it. I, 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 not as a policy, I only have white friends. Um, 
and I hate that. I'm very much trying to change that while I'm here. I'm trying to set up some sort of draft um, and lose some of these guys. We did that one night, and then the second night, I swear to God, he went for a fist bump. I didn't really see it in the darkness, and I did paper. First night, first night, first night. I like, gotcha, I, I fucking... So we do all these shows and it was amazing, but here's the thing, as soon as his set ended, his entire crew, eight security guys, ex-NYPD, ex-Navy SEALs, top guys, would form a human corridor and he would just walk out straight into a moving car. So then I would jump back on and I go, ladies and gentlemen, get off Kevin Hart, I'm a chain talk good night. So we never had an interaction, and if we did, it was pitch black darkness. So I never got to meet him. But eight shows in, it was a Saturday night, summer's night, really good weather, everybody was feeling good in the venue. Kevin seems really relaxed at these shows. I think if you're gonna meet him, if you're gonna have a chat, a drink, a photo, whatever, it's gonna be tonight. When me and him have a drink, people are gonna lose their fucking minds. Imagine walking into that heart thought. <laughs> Two guys on an equal footing just talking shop. And so show goes as normal. I go up on stage. Two minutes into my set, I hear the cars. I know he travels in three blacked out Mercedes people carriers. I get the flash, Kevin's ready. Ladies and gentlemen, Kevin Hart goes dark, music hits. We pass each other on the stairs. He goes on. When his set's over, I wait at the bottom of this little staircase and I go back on. But again, he never sees me because the lights go down even for that. So this particular night, he's like, I love y'all. I'm Kevin Hart, good night. He walks past, I grab the mic, ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Kevin Hart, safe home, see you later. When I get to the bottom of the stairs, the boys are waiting. Kevin and the entourage, the boys are just waiting for me with the doors open, the cars are running. And one of the security guys just brings me. Now it's all pretty fast, but this big guy, the stage to the car is like five feet. All of a sudden, this security guy, who's never spoken to me, gets me into the car as well. And I end up in one of three Mercedes top of the range people carriers. I end up in the back row. And the way he throws me in, I, I just like stay in that position. <laughs> and I, I can't believe this. I'm gonna have a drink with Kevin Hart tonight. We're going back to the hotel to have a pint. It's the coolest moment of my life. <laughs> Two security guys get in the row in front of me. I'm just lying in the back. All of a sudden, Kevin Hart's tour manager, Kevin Hart. Oh my God, I lose my mind. We start to move off very slowly because there's a little bit of traffic. My phone pings, I got a text. I felt bad about that. I was like, is that rude that my phone pinged? Because I don't want any distractions, I'm with Kev. It was a text from Kevin Hart's manager. It said, great job tonight, man, I heard. Now, I'm looking at that like, okay, that's really lovely, but that's also weird, because this guy's like two rows in front of me in the vehicle, so. I'm lying in the back being like these crazy Americans, like these guys, they text instead of talking, even though we're in the same car. I was like, this, this is showbiz, though, this is the way it is. Maybe this initiation to fuck with me, you know, getting into the crew. So I text him back, LOL. <laughs> and he texts me back with a question mark. And it was at that point I realized they did not know that I was in the vehicle. <laughs> what had happened is there was a security breach. A guy tried to jump a cordon and get a selfie with Kevin Hart. They held everybody back while they fucked the guy out. Then they just all of a sudden were like, go, go, go. I am quite a thin young man who just happened to be near there. And when everything was dark, the security guy was just like, fucking everyone's in and didn't look at anybody's face. I then realized I needed to announce my presence <laughs> in the car in front of Kevin Hart, his manager, the NYPD guy in the Navy SEAL from the darkness of the back seat. <laughs> I said, oh, it's me. <laughs> Have you seen in Fresh Prince of Bel Air where Uncle Phil fucks Jazzy Jeff out of the house? One of the security guys fucked me out into the street before I could explain, I'm like him. <laughs> On my way out, I was like, this is actually fine because they don't see me at the shows anyway, so I'm going to be able to keep doing the show. So I, I land on the pavement just about on my feet. The cars speed away. They thought it was just some crazed fan trying to fucking murder Kevin. Oh my God, this is the most embarrassing thing that's ever going to happen in my life. Everybody who had been at the gig 
was now filtering down this street. <laughs> they see what they definitely know to be Kevin Hart's vehicles pass. Me get fucked out of it. <laughs> and one of my mates was there, a comic, smoking outside the bar. And he looked at me and he looked at the people carriers, speed off on record speed. And he said, did you think Kevin Hart wanted to have a pint of Guinness for you? <laughs> After a show? <laughs> Why would you think that? He's like, that's so embarrassing, but it actually wasn't. And I realized it wasn't a defeat. I couldn't have gone for a pint with Kevin anyway, him and the boys, I couldn't have. Cause I need to get a loaf of bread on the way home anyway. <laughs> So I said, Kevin, I said, away you go. Away you go. I'll get you next time. I'll get you next time. I have one more bit left, but I just want to say thanks so much for coming to this. This is like my first tour of America that I've ever done. And amazing, thank you. Thank you so much. If anybody wants, I'll, I'll hang about after, but don't make any bangs go off or anything like that. <laughs> Blown away by it, thank you. The thing that keeps me grand is uh, reading a bedtime story to my son. Son's two now. I know a joke about him, but honestly, reading him a bedtime story is the best. I know there's other dads in here, like, oh, I read my son a bedtime story, but don't forget, I'm a performer. And I like to think I bring something to it. Level of performance when I'm reading my son a bedtime story. Yes, I see it. <laughs> I always finish shows like this. I always finish shows like this. What was she in touch you like? He fucking released the spider from the wild at the end of it. This guy's magical. I had to bring that over from Ireland, mental. Um, I was reading a bedtime story recently and it was about monsters. And it was letting him know that monsters don't need to be scary. You can have cute, fluffy, fun, funny monsters. They don't need to be scary monsters that are gonna get you. So he's in bed and I'm reading him a story, just a regular father's, you know, just casual. I'm at my, he's in bed and I'm at my lectern. And um, with a lighting rig kind of similar to this. And I, um, for the performance, and I, uh, in, in my turtleneck. Because there's other dads in here. I read my son a bedtime story. This is different. <laughs> Two lines in, my son says, Daddy, monster door. And I said, um, what? He said, Daddy, monster door. I said, no, 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 it's just, um, I said, this is a monologue, um, which means, that means one person. Um, <laughs> Speaking, my son said, Daddy, monster door. Daddy, look. I said, son, there's no monster behind the door. He said, Daddy, please. Couldn't handle him looking at me like that. I said, Daddy, go and look, okay, you wait there. Walk over to the door. I said, see, there's no monsters behind the door. Now, obviously, I didn't really look. I'm not taking that chance. <laughs> I, as we get back into the store. We're in the middle of the book. It's not a long book. He goes again, Daddy, monster wardrobe. I said, what? <laughs> what the fuck? Friends with Kevin Hart. <laughs> you don't know him? He's like, Daddy, I know him as well as you do. I'm like, fuck off. <laughs> Went over to the wardrobe, opened it up, said, see, son, no monsters in the wardrobe. Now, that's me letting you guys know what happened, but also me letting you know that I've, you know those sliding wardrobes? <laughs> Saw a few people being like, where's the handle? No monsters. <laughs> the end of the book, he goes again. He goes again. Daddy, monster bed. I said, son, there are no monsters under the bed. Daddy, look. I said, you know what? I'm gonna prove it to you as well, because I need you to know that it's okay. But anyway, if there ever was a monster, ever, anywhere, daddy would protect you. He smiled at me, I said, come on. Come on, we'll look together. Take him out of bed. We go over. He's all scared and all. So am I. And I... <laughs> I sort of make him go in front a little bit. And I said... I said, son, there's no monsters. Don't worry. Daddy can protect you. And we just had a wee moment together. We go over. It's an important moment in his life. I lift back the sheets at the bottom of his bed. We both kneel down. I say, son, there's no monsters under your bed. And then just at the last minute, all I heard was... All right, partner! <laughs> I said, Danny can't protect you. Guys, you've been unbelievable. Chicago, thank you so much. This means so much to me. I'm in Shane Todd. Good night.
Guys, guys, give it up for Shane Todd. Keep it going. Guys, thank you so much for coming out. Make sure you tip your servers. You're going to get home safe. Every guy, one more time for Shane Todd. Come on, give it up for him. Thank you, guys.